You're listening to Market Champions, a podcast on navigating the financial markets. Here's your host, Srivasa Prakash. Hey guys, I wanted to take this opportunity to remind you all to like and subscribe. It really helps me to keep getting the best guests onto the podcast. So I really appreciate it if you did. And now on to the video. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Market Champions. Today we've got one of the most legendary traders of all time. We've got Victor Niederhofer. He's also the author of two incredible books on trading. One is called The Education of a Speculator and the other one's called Practical Speculation. And thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you, Shri. Nice to be here. Awesome. So I wanted to start off with a little bit about your background. So, you know, for people who might not know who you are, could you just tell us a little bit about your background and your journey uh, on Wall Street? Well, I had a big journey in Canada. Uh, I played a lot of squash there, especially in, <clears throat> I won the Canadian Nationals and about 50 years ago in 1970 and played a lot in Montreal. I played Sharif Khan, it was a very famous match in Montreal and Toronto. Now you want to know about my background. I wish I was as good in um, markets as I was in squash, but um, my background in markets started when I watched my father uh, tabulating handball scores. Handball was a big game in Brighton Beach where I was born. And my father wrote a book on handball, one wall handball. And to do that, he calculated the percentage of off the wall winners, the percentage of uh, winners from on the service the percentage of winners um, from the right side and the left side and from, uh, and then um, my next, um, my next experience in trading was doing some horse handicapping at a, at Yonkers Raceway, tabulating did uh, things similar to uh, what what I do now. I looked at the percentage of of winners from various posts and the percentage of winners when your record was eighty percent or thirty percent, and so on. In fact, um, one of the prime books that I recommend to all my followers is um, The Principles of, of Professional Turf Trading by Robert Bacon, which is a book on, probably the best book on horse handicapping and it has some fantastic insights for stock market trading. In fact, uh, it's so popular that it's very hard to get now. What else? Did, your, uh, did the fact that your grandfather, Martin Niederhoff, a trade with Jesse Livermore, did that have sort of an impact on you? And, you know, what was that impact? The impact um, was that my grandfather lost all his money in the Depression. He was very successful in real estate and stock trading before that. And He bought me my first stock when I was 13. It was 100 shares of Ben Gay, which was the cheapest stock on the New York Stock Exchange. It was at three quarters. And I waited about five years um, to sell it at one. And then in the three months after I sold it, it went to 10. And that's a good lesson that I think people should always 
assume that a, a stock is going to break through the round number. In that case, the round number was one. And when it breaks through the chances of the expectations for the next year are very high. I once did a study like that at the University of Chicago where I looked at every stock that had broken through 10. And in those days, it very rarely, they very rarely broke through 100, but it, they had a much higher expectation than, than the norm. You were asking about my grandfather. He was, he was a model. He went to a place called Townsend Harris High School. It's for special, for special students. And he, uh, <clears throat> he was very able and he became the bookkeeper and treasurer at Irving Berlin's um, music firm. And there he met his wife. He, married, he asked her to marry her the first day she was on the job. He took the trolley. She said, yes, I'll have to ask my mother. But they took the trolley to Coney Island. And I used to follow his stocks. But he lost everything in depression by excessive margin. And that was a very good lesson to learn also. And then after that, he was always very, he was always very partial to the short side. Because when a stock went up, 20, 30 percent. He knew from the past that it, they were likely to go back down. And unfortunately, um, he missed the uh, drift in the stock market, which is 60,000 for the century because he had been burned by the depression. Right. Now, and well, during your career, you got to trade for uh, you know the mad, the, the legend George Soros. So. What's that experience like, and what were the biggest lessons that you learned, you know, while trading for George Soros? Well, the biggest lesson I learned was to always use two cans of balls when you were playing tennis. Was, um, that way, you didn't spend time on going looking for the other balls. And then, and the second lesson I learned was um, that survival is the main thing. You know? Sometimes I, every, and I learned not to be short. He was always, he always had a negative view of the stocks and um, it was my job to sometimes wean him away from his um, negative view of the stock market. Let's see, what else did I learn from him? Um, he was a very good host. I spent many summers at the, uh, at his Southampton home. And um, I also, um, I'm trying to think what I learned from him. I learned that I learned how not to let your political philosophy um, affect the market. We had different views concerning the virtues of capitalism and, and the world state. And um, that's pretty much what I learned from him. Right. And you know, I'm curious, I wanted to get more into the trading side of things. So now I'm curious, uh, today, uh, a lot of people who use uh, technical analysis, they look at patterns and that kind of stuff. And, you know, a lot of the most uh, quantitative guys, like, uh, they usually say that this kind of thing cannot be tested. So therefore, you know, you can't really falsify it and you can't really prove it. So I wanted to ask you, what is your view on technical analysis? and sort of the subjective kind of technical analysis, you know, where people sort of look for patterns in the markets. I'm a believe, uh, great non-believer. I think a person shouldn't use 
technical analysis, I think most of it is, is um, a fantasia and is not worth not worth the uh, paper it's written on. It's, um, it's um, useless and it's um, epicyclic and it um, is um, very deceptive and it's a snare and a delusion. I think everybody should avoid technical analysis. Right, and With you know, all the, and the major. Uh, the major methods are um, Milwaukee and very, very dysfunctional. No, and you know, Soros and Druckenmiller are sort of famous for using technical analysis. So, you know, how did Soros sort of go about testing his technical analysis? You know, is there like any- Soros, Soros didn't believe in technical analysis. He didn't, he didn't believe in testing. He did everything. Um, based upon um, feel and his ideas concerning um, whether he was ahead or below the mob and whether the basic ideas he had were going to be picked up um, right. and uh, utilized by the mob and uh, how he could um, how he could extend the um, the crowd that followed him. He, he was very good at. He had a great reputation, and when he'd buy something, he'd alert uh, his his group or uh, the main people that followed him. And uh, by the time by the time the twenty institutions that followed him were in it, uh, there'd be a uh, An epidemic of um, of buying and selling. So he, he was very good at manipulating um, the crowds to follow him, either buying and selling. He'd get on television when he was he was about to sell. He'd say the market was very bad, and he was about to buy. Say the market looked very good, but he was very rarely did he say that the market looked very good. He was also very very great at um, utilizing the power of compound interest and, uh, uh, and he, he got situated in an advantageous uh, and um, that was that by compounding all of his um, management fees and the uh, meager returns that he did make without paying taxes on it, he was able to amass quite a fortune. Right. And, you know, Soros, in his book, The Alchemy of Finance, he sort of describes, um, you know, his process for sort of trend following and boom bust cycles. And, you know, you're sort of a counter trend trader. And I believe you described a situation uh, in the education of a speculator where you mentioned that Soros asked you why you weren't exactly following the trend and why you went against it. So you now has that uh, you know sort of converted you into a trend follower or are you still sort of a counter trend kind of guy? I believe that for individual stocks, uh, the studies of Dimson, Marsh and Staunton show that um, the stocks that go up the most tend to continue. I believe that um, when the the first X months of the year are up, it's more bullish for the market for the rest of the year. But in general, the expectations for the stock market are much greater after a period of decline and a period of rise. Mm -hmm. So I've become more bullish after a period of decline. We haven't had um, such a period of decline um, since March of 2020. Right. But I, I don't um, I don't believe in following trends in, in any other market. I think 
in general, all the friend fellows I know have, have ended up um, losing a fortune in their in their um, funds. And John Henry um, is a typical example. He he lost ninety. He was a big trend follower in my day. He lost ninety percent um, in his his fund, and then and then all his investors sued him, and then they uh, as a as compensation, he allowed them to come in with him the next time in his next fund without fees. Then he lost a hundred percent in the next one. And then he fortunately moved on to um, baseball ownership, which he's very good at. So one of the things that- and The other the other one I called the large man, and he was uh, Dennis. And um, he, before he went, went under, um, He had a, a lot of followers, uh, they called turtles, and all of their methods were um, complete um, gobbled in the book also. And uh, it's the problem with the trends is that you can't test them because you, you lose money most of the time. And then on the few times that you make money, the principle of ever-changing cycles comes to um, reverse the, um, the winds. In other words, when if it shows that you know one out of ten times you make a thousand percent, the next time it gets in that situation, the market already anticipates that they that people are playing for a thousand percent rise. So then instead of making a thousand percent, you lose 990 percent. Right. You lose nine out of 10 times. So all, all those methods are, um, are intuited by the average trader and, and the market moves to levels that make it unprofitable to make the trends also the tremendous transactions costs on trend following also. One of the things that you have been able to do is sort of try and figure out how to statistically get an edge in the market. So, you know, for the average trader, you know, how do they go about sort of trying to discover or trying to find an edge in the market? What is the process? The key is to test everything, never to take anything on faith, never to believe anything that, the, things are seldom what they seem. And everything is deceptive and duplicit in the market and everything is designed to enable the infrastructure to make a lot of money at your expense. When, uh, when I started, uh, trading since I've only been trading for 60, 60 years actually, which I think is, is a record. Uh, Clues wrote a book um, 50 years in Wall Street, but if I ever wrote a book, it would have to be 65 years in Wall Street. But in any case, since 1970, I've been tabulating every half hour price of 20 different markets. And I have all the books with the prices since 1970, every half hour. And then I look at, I look at all the interactions between those markets. I believe in what they call the uh, analysis of multivariate time series. And the relations between these markets, the leads and, and lags, um, unfortunately change every day of the week, every hour of the day. 
So that's a start. I've had hundreds of, of employees and, and partners and they've all come to me with um, different ideas um, in the market, but somehow by the time they left and um, took my programs and ideas, they all using the interactions between markets as a predictor. And I think that that is one of the main methods that's used now, thanks to me in predicting uh, stock prices. I know that Renaissance uses um, methods based on that, although they didn't get it from me in that case. The one of the few that didn't take my work. And so what sort of like a correlation would be needed for you to say that that is a tradable edge? Well, it's not so much the statistical significance of the correlation because um, there's a big difference between statistical significance and predictivity. If you're going to do a proper study of uh, of predictions, you have to start with what you would know if you started from zero. Like if, if you wanted to look at how you could predict the market in 2020, you'd have to say, now what would I have known in 2019 when I had two observations? And when we have seven, we have to do prospective testing so that each each uh, day, you have to update your your work and see what your prediction would have been. And there's a tremendous difference between looking at the end of a period and then calculating what the statistical significance is and what would have what you would have found out if you started six if you tried it after three months and after six months and and so on. Right. And you know, as markets evolve, edges sort of come and go. So, you know, how have markets say, uh, how have markets changed since you sort of professionally ran a fund? And, you know, do you think it's easier today or harder today uh, to make money? Well, the, uh, the rake is probably um, the rake in and sports betting is five and a half percent. And I think the way most people trade, which is uh, who use technical analysis, I think their rate is, is more than five and a half percent. That's the thing that, that the infrastructure takes out because now, now with the high frequency trading and all the advantages that the, um, uh, the exchanges give to the uh, to the to the big traders and the big capital. Uh, it's very very hard to um, to beat the the infrastructure. They take out too much, and the only way to beat them is to buy and hold, take advantage of the sixty thousand fold a century. Uh, drift in the stock market. I think a, a rule that people should follow is never to sell short, certainly not in the stock market because it's hard to be um, something like 750% a year, which, which the 60,000 fold a century is equivalent to. So the markets have evolved. The markets have evolved when I started, when my grandfather just traded with Jesse Livermore. Um, unfortunately, he, he didn't, uh, he, he didn't uh, get the advantage of um, traveling on Jesse's yachts um, to France when, when, when Jesse went bankrupt. Jesse used to pay a commission of five or six percent, and the bid ask spread was another three or four percent. So when by the time he traded, he would be 
down 10% and he, he was a very active trader. So he might have turnover three times a week. So it's no wonder that he went bankrupt five times. Um, and then when he tried to sell his methods and it, they didn't work, he committed suicide in, at the Sherry Neverland's Hotel in, in New York. And that's on 63rd Street and Central Park, um, Central Park East. Uh, I, ne I never, whenever I pass that area, I always cross the street. But the brokerage houses used to give him, after he lost 100%, they would fund him again because they knew that he would generate in commissions enough uh, to, for them to make back the money that they loaned him. Of course, there was a, a loan like the PPT where you didn't have to pay it back. So uh, in those days, it was impossible to trade um, any anywhere um, with anything less than a six-month holding period. Right. There's, there's some there's some books that the magazine of Wall Street is a, probably the best trading book on on Wall Street. It was from about 1907 to um, 19. 40 and it has many methods of trading that worked in those days. One, one was to be a specialist in panics. Uh, a big problem is not only the rake and the vig, but it's the fact that the, your adversaries generally have much more capital than you. So that if there's a normal fluctuation, they can withstand it, they can, um, but uh, you, you won't have the, the capital to withstand the normal fluctuation. So even if they didn't have an edge, you would go bankrupt. Uh, and, and again, um, rapid trading, day trading is something that selling short and all these things are, are anathema, should be avoided. Got it. You know, one of the things that you mentioned in the education of a speculator, I believe in the first chapter where you were describing a situation where you were trading the yen and you mentioned the yen and, you know, you talk about what happens to the yen when soybeans go up and gold goes down. And you now if, if you go to sort of, you know, the average market participant, you know, they're probably going to say, you know, those three things are not related. So could you, number one, uh, comment on what the relation is and, you know, these sort of random correlations, you know, do they really have sort of an edge when it comes to trading? Well, about three days ago, out of 20 markets, all 20 were at all time highs. The grains were at an all time high. The meats were at an all time high. The European markets were at an all time high. The NASDAQ was at an all time high. Um, how was the Canadian mark? Was that an all-time high also a few days ago? I believe so, yes. So they were all, they were all at all-time so um, They're all related to each other when um, they, they depend upon the amount of animal spirits, the amount of money that's in the system, the amount of um, quantitative easing and the relations are always there, but they change. They change every every month. If they didn't change, it, people would would follow them, and we, it would be too easy to make money. It's not it's not easy to make money. I've never found it easy. But if you looked in the last. 60 days, you'd find correlations, a positive correlation between the grains and the stock market, certainly between the European and the Canadian market and the US market. 
were always predictive correlations. Unfortunately, they vary at the beginning and the end of the week. So you can't, it could be a correlation that exists in the first part of the week, but it doesn't exist in the last part of the week. Could you describe how we could sort of, you know, use these correlations to actually trade the market? Could you then sort of like give an example? Well, <clears throat> If you found that um, when the uh, Japanese market was down on a, on a Monday, the U.S. stock market tends to go up on a Tuesday um, during the uh, first three months of the year. That would be it. Would it would be between two different markets on special days? of the week. Again, one would have to test this as if he knew on a prospective basis, going forward basis. Right. You have to assume this is, is try to find what correlation there existed after you had been looking for two months at the data. And then based upon that, what you would be trading for the next month and then update it constantly. Right, yeah. that makes a lot of sense. Thank you for that. You know, if you had to sort of write a book titled The Essential Math for a Trader, you know, what would that book contain? You know, what is sort of the essential mathematics that every trader in your opinion uh, should know? Well, every trader should have a, a grounding in as many fields as they could because everything relates to the stock market. That's one of the things that makes it so exciting. And over the weekend, I was reading about um, the survival stories of explorers, I was reading a book um, on ecology, very good book. Um, which I, I would recommend. And it's reading um, the operas of Verdi. Good to listen, listen to music. Um, it has a lot of relations to the to the markets. As far as um, quantitative trading, a person should know regression very well. He should know simulation. He should know survival statistics. And um, those, those are really the, um, should, should to be grounded well in time series analysis. It's good to right. good to know how to integrate very well. Should um, should go over all your exponential integrals because a lot of a lot of them will arise in survival statistics and. A good, um, a good book on um, the um, regression bias is very, very important also. Not just regression analysis, but the um, regression bias tendency for <clears throat> what, what other books do you think are are important. Um, I, I have a, um, when Steve Stigler, who's the chairman of the uh, statistics department at the University of Chicago comes to my house, he always says, my library is bigger than his. I have, I have every statistics book that has been published um, before 2006 and I'm, I'm always reading them. 
but um, those are the those are the ones that that are to be referred. Simulations, simulation books, and and survival. Those are the keys. And do you, when you say simulation, do you mean like Monte Carlo simulations, that kind of thing? Yes, a person should have a good program on simulation that they should use all the time. A very good thing. When I started out in 1964 at the University of Chicago, Harry Roberts had written an article in which he had generated a random series and he had put some levels on it and he dared stock traders to compare his random series with stock market series of the day and no one, no one could tell the difference. A lot of the, uh, a lot of the random series look like they have trends and look like they have patterns, but they're random. Right. A lot of randomness in the market. But if you never short, if you never day trade, and if you buy and hold, then you'll be with the um, gods. Right. Now, in, in sort of a recent interview, you mentioned that you would highly recommend a book called The Triumph of the Optimist. But then you would, uh, I believe you said that you would sort of shun a remnant, a reminiscences of a stock operator. And uh, did you say that like sort of jokingly or, you know, why well, would you? No, I think that's the worst book for people to read. And it's, of course, it's the most popular. You see, every, uh, a, a good thing to, to believe is that everything you hear about the stock market is untrue. And it's designed to make you um, give, to generate money to the infrastructure, to the to the big traders, people who have have more unlimited funds, and all the all that you read has to be designed to get you to be bearish and um, those. Those, those are the keys. Right. You know, as a statistician, you've tested a lot of, you know, what goes Every, on. What, I've what, tested everything. Yeah. So, uh, you know, what are the most common, uh, you know, adages or myths in trading that are actually statistically false, but then, you know, they still keep going around? Well, I think the idea that double tops, triple tops, and channels are um, that double top is, is bearish and uh, breakthrough of a channel is a Bollinger Band is, um, is bullish and that um, moving averages, uh, that one, I guess the biggest, uh, the biggest thing that throws people off is the concept of a correction. That all the media are always looking for a correction. You know, if for every if the market goes down five percent, uh, there'll be ten times as much bearish media reports as if the market goes up five percent. Now, when the market goes 10, any market or any stock goes down 10%, all the advisory services will point out that the market is in a correction. But no one has tested whether when it goes down 10%, it's bullish or bearish. And the fact is that when a market goes down 10%, it's more bullish than, than ever when it except that when it goes down 20%, it's even more bullish. So uh, the, other, the other things are that's 
probably the, the worst, um, most common mistake is the thing that won a Nobel Prize for Schiller, uh, which is that um, he, he's been there since 1950 and so on. And, uh, The P's, he uses a, a 10 year average of the current price divided by the 10 year average of earnings. So he doesn't take account of the fact that earnings, earnings today are more important than earnings 10 years ago. And that if there's a negative correlation between 10 year earnings and future prices, and there has to be a positive correlation between current earnings. And taking account of P's without regard to interest rates is, a, is probably the biggest mistake. People say, well, the market has a P of 22 now, but that's, that's higher than it's in the top 5% of all P's, but the P's have to be adjusted by interest rates. Now, the relation of earnings price ratio to interest rates is very bullish. In fact, whenever, um, whenever the earnings price ratio, which is now about um, 5% versus, say, a 1.5% 10 year rate, there's, whenever there's a big differential like that, the, more, the greater the differential, the more bullish it is. So those I think, um, and, and in addition to corrections and double tops and P's, I'd say that the main thing is that trend following works, doesn't work. It's the reason that people use it is um, um, it's a money maker for those who tout it. That's about it. So more money goes to the gurus than to the actual traders. <laughs> well, it's, it's a very hard to uh, quantify. Um, trend you can't, you can, you can look at moving averages, and when the price is above the moving average, uh, say a two hundred day moving average, compare compare that to the price being below ten. Uh, a 200 day moving average, you'll find that in general, it's more bullish for the, for the below. Whenever it crosses from above to below, there's usually a, a big stock market decline. That's a great time to buy. Right. You know, if you were sort of starting off today, you know, and you know all uh, that you've learned over the last 65 years of trading. What would you do different? I would never sell anything short. Because um, I would never trade in illiquid markets. And um, I would never sell volatility. Not because it's not a winning strategy, but because the liquidity is too low. And when you try to extricate from your position for the expiration date, there's a 50 or 100% bid ass spread. And so right. you can't extricate unless at the expiration date and the, uh, the movements are designed to um, to cause margin calls, and um, there's um, a conspiracy of those who uh, who make the markets to um, to help um, do yourself in. So I would never sell volatility. Haven't sold it for ten years or so. And um, make, you can make money. Um, again, it's a winning strategy, and you make money 24 out of 25 months. But then every five or seven years, they 
They run the volatility up to a ridiculously high level designed to create margin calls. And then your counterpart is, is likely to take the other side of your trade. And um, in any case, to call, call in your, your margin so that you can make money for 10 years in a row and then you could lose it in, in the next month and then then a week later you'd be back back making money again. So after but never selling short is a good that that covers a lot of things because it's very hard to buy back stock that you that you don't own. Of course um, Um, with the stock markets drift to 60,000 fold uh, a century, you don't, you don't ever want to sell stocks short there. And since the stock market um, or has a, a ripple effect on every other market when it goes up as it has in the last um, six months, it, it brings every other market up, so it's a good one not to be selling short. And of course, never sell short in the um, stock market because not only do you have to pay the dividends, but you have to pay money to borrow the stock. So you're paying money when you sell short to, to borrow the stock and um, you're going against the 750 percent a year shift. Right. Yeah. And we see it in today's market as well, you know, with stocks like Tesla and you know, all these other euphoric uh, companies, you know, anyone who has short those stocks, they'll uh, they'll get burnt in the markets. And you know what you're saying is you know incredibly true. Well um, I I used to um, have with Laurel kind of a, um, a, a weekly column that I wrote for MSM. And I interviewed a trader about 19, uh, this, this must have been about 2000, 1999. And his technique was to buy the stock that was up the most in a year. You take, you'd like as of June, you'd look at all the stocks and then you'd buy the two or three that had gone up the most. And he was very profitable then and he's been very profitable afterwards. It's very hard to test that because you, a lot of these stocks, uh, weren't at the uh, weren't enumerated at the inception so that if you look at stocks as of 19 as the beginning of 1990 they, they'd be different from the ones that were were around in, in, in the second in the second half of 1990 but in any case I think that's probably a good strategy it's it's a, it's the most intuitive strategy is the one that people would say is the worst. My daughter um, has a, a trade stocks and she has about, she, she doesn't know what a, a balance sheet is and uh, she doesn't know what, uh, she doesn't, uh, I think she knows what a PE is, but uh, certainly not an e EP. I mean, she has about 15 stocks in our portfolio, and 13 of them have gone up more than fivefold wow. in the last in the last two or three years. And she has Tesla, and she has Amazon. And she has um, Beyond Meat, and she's. She does a lot better in her trading than I do in mine. But in any case, she 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 follows it. She based on what she feels is going to be attractive to the uh, 
to her cohort, to the, to the social media and, and right, yeah. that, uh, the things that are most uh, exciting and most, most coming and she, she follows the strategy that my friend who's now the uh, who's now the uh, the managing partner or senior director of the North Carolina fund. He's a very he's one of the smartest investors I know. And Jim Laurie, my thesis advisor, also was a buy and hold man. And he, whenever he got a tip, he'd buy the stock and When he passed away, unfortunately, which um, was a tragedy, still is a tragedy, uh, even though it was uh, 15 years ago, um, he, followed, he followed that strategy of buying the stocks that were up the most. Usually when he got a tip, the stock had already gone up 100%. He'd buy it, and then by the time he sold it 10 years later, it would be up a thousand percent. So that's a very good strategy also buying the stock, but it has to be tested, but it's very hard to be tested, to test something like that. I mean, if you use the Bloomberg, um, if you use the Bloomberg listing of, of the S&P stocks and they give, they give the performance of every stock, every S&P stock for the last, X years, but it would be hard to tell. You have to use an S and P as is file, right? Yeah. So I wanted to ask you, uh, leaving out 1997 and 2006, what would be your best ba uh, your best pick of your career, your largest miss of your career, and how did you find them? You've got too many to choose from. Bring, in terms of wins. Bring back uh, some dismal memories um, by um, in those years. Um, but I've I don't recall any of my great trades. I recall my losing trades. I recall my losing matches in, in squash. Um, but in, in general, um, when I've bought, when I've bought stocks, when I've bought the index, which is what I trade, it's generally been very good. And when I've been frightened out by duplicit, um, by, um, by squalls and panics, the worst things are when you have margin calls and you're not, and you're not able to meet them and invariably the day after you can't meet your margin call, all the banks and institutions are able to make a fortune the next day, but they, they make it at your expense. So it's very important to have um, proper, um, proper money management. Person in buy and hold, probably it's, it's not good to leverage more than two and a half times. Instead of making 60,000 for the century, you'd make 150,000 for the century if you leverage two and a half times. You wouldn't, and you wouldn't run into gambler's room. Oh, I had a pretty good run now that I recall. And when I started trading in 1979, I I started out with a hundred thousand dollars and I ran it up into twenty million dollars in uh, in six months. 
that I, I bought gold, and so I believe then. Uh, um, the in the view that um, thing that stock market, uh, which, excuse me, the gold was the store of store of value that would always always be there, and the interest were going to go through the roof. And, I made a lot of money then. Of course, I lost it. I lost it um, one day when I was playing racquetball against Ruben Gonzalez. And after the first first game, I, I called my office and I'd lost something like 50% of my, my game. But fortunately, and this is another rule that people should follow, they should quit when they've made a lot of money, not when they've lost a lot of money. Anyway, I had a, I had a rule then that, that if I lost more than 50% of my, my wealth, I would, I would liquidate and I, left my assistants news that they should do so and it was between the first and second game of my match with them that they liquidated me. Eventually married the girl who liquidated me. She, she's become a pretty perfect wife. Been married for 40 years. She's, um, she and I wrote the first um, program um, that I captured the multivariate um, interactions between time series. There's an article by Kendall in about 1956 that was called the, that talked about the interrelations between all the markets. It didn't have any predictive relations and used a lot of flawed data, but that the, the magazine of Wall Street and the articles by Cowles and Econometrica from about 1926 um, using sequences and reversals and run. Well, I should have, I should have said that it's very important to, um, to have a good book on probability and to be able to um, calculate runs and reversals and right. Yeah. What they call scans, scans um, like eighteen out of twenty—not only eighteen rises in a row, but eighteen out of twenty rises, and so on. So, good book on probability is very important. Fella, the fellas' books are very good on probability. Got it. Now, when you wrote the education of a speculator, you described a situation. You know where, uh, you know, when you were on a good run, your brokers would sort of tell you, you know, where the where their customer stops were and so on. But then, you know, today instead of you know the dealers of back then, you're dealing with people like Citadel. So, you know, how is that different from a speculator standpoint? Well, you shouldn't be in a position where stops um, affect you. You should should have your money management so that you're not more than two and a half times. Like if you have a million dollars, you shouldn't have more than two and a half million in, in the market. And you shouldn't you shouldn't be subject to uh, to stops and whenever you shouldn't be competing with them. It's impossible to compete with someone who's as an infrastructure that they spent hundreds of millions to, uh, to, to gain an edge on you. And whenever you make a trade, you find that a high frequency trader is um, ahead of you and it increases the bid ask and then, um, makes it, makes the rake even higher than than it normally is. Right. But so it, you should get in a situation where uh, where stops don't 
don't affect you and certainly where um, should have enough capital behind your position so that a, uh, a normal move of 10% won't, won't affect you, won't cause a stop. Right. So to conclude the podcast, I wanted to ask you, you now as a champion squash player and now, as sort of an incredible chess player as well. I'm no. not. I'm not. I'm not an incredible chess player. I'm a good checker player. I think check is a much better training for traders than chess. There, in fact, there are some very good uh, Canadian check checker players, but check is 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 much more like log- electrical circuits, and it's either up. Uh, it's either forward or back and you can only move one space. And it's very, very much similar to the kind of logical thinking that goes into uh, all electronics and computers and chess. Chess is a game that has no relationship to uh, real life. Although a lot of the uh, principles of check is chess and check is a, a similar one. Right? Um, the threat is worse than the execution. Right, so, right. And you know, what are the lessons that you can apply from checkers and squash into markets? That's a very good question. That's a very good question. I have a book of Tom Wiswell's proverbs on checkers, life and markets. And he has 5,000 proverbs that he wrote for me. He's written 20 books and he always said that the book that had all his proverbs in it was going to be his his best book. Um, I described some of these proverbs in Ed Spec. I, I think a lot of them can be summarized in, hold on a second. Uh, let's see what Tom likes to have. He'd say, whenever you think your opponent has made a mistake, remember this proverb of the, of the spider and the fly. And when he, he would also point out that you should never try for a tactical spectacular tactical win but you should try to grind rather than win win with one or two moves you know you say write everything down all the good all the good checker players in those days had manuscripts in which they write every game down. Um, say when when you had a loss, think about why you had your loss, write it down, come back again. Um, you'd also say the, uh, so when you draw, you both win. Um, A lot of his proverbs could be summarized that everything is duplicit in checkers. And, uh, never, never assume that you're a good player when you're playing against a good player that they've made a mistake. There's no such thing as an easy win. And when you go for a, they call, they call in checkers a, a coup or um, 
that one, one can take a three for two or a five for four or something like that. A good play never falls into a trap. And when you think that, when you think that the adversary in the market has given you a, an unbeatable situation, that's the time to, um, to avoid it the most. Anyway, I, I have to look at my checkerbook. Um, maybe I'll, I'll write, write uh, I'll put on my blog um, the 20 best lessons from Tom Westphal in terms of checkers, life, and markets. And uh, now as for squash, and as I say, I wish I was as good in markets as I was in squash. And whether I should have been much better in squash, I, I had quite a few defects. One thing I learned in squash is that lessons help a lot. I, I probably had more lessons than anyone else in the world. I had lessons in clarinet and piano, and ice skating, and tennis. And, and awesome. <laughs> And, and, uh, but one, once or twice a week from the time I was five and dancing and speech. Uh, so I've learned a lot from every lesson that I've ever taken. And then I found it was very important to prepare for every match, to get there an hour or two in advance to practice. Then I also found it very important to, to practice every day. I kept a diary of my playing and publishing a book. And for 10 years, I played 365 days a year. Wow. And, and that was very important. And I, I do that a little bit in the market. As I said, I've kept half hourly prices from 1970 to the present of 20, 20 different markets. Um, in, in racket sports, I, I was ne never really very good in tennis or anything like that, although I was fairly good in racquetball. I was in the top 10. But Never, um, never try to win a point outright. I played what they called an errorless game. I could, I could make points, but it was very hard to make a point against me because I always hit it in, above the 10. And I think that's very important. In the stock market to grind rather than try to make um, ephemeral profits. Um, play with a new ball that was important, have proper equipment. Right. See, in closing, if I had some advice, try to summarize what I've seen now, now that I'm 100 years old, I, could, I don't have to hold back any, any um, things or be afraid of consequences for talking about the infrastructure having a tremendous edge on you and every, everything being designed to. Um, make the public lose money to the infrastructure. I think it's very important to read books on ecology. Ecology? The ecology, yeah, the, rela the relation, because everything is evolving as you, you were asking me what's, everything's always changing in the market. And, 
and it's related to ever-changing cycles. So good, good knowledge of ecology and the relation between the top producers and the, the bottom producers is very important. And don't day trade, don't, don't sell short. Absolutely. And be, be humble. That, that was another thing that in, in my rackets career, I was always very humble. I always thought that my, I, I always thought that my opponent had an edge on me because they were younger or more um, faster or stronger, good, more mobile. So um, it was very important to, to be humble and to assume that unless you were at your, your peak, unless you tried the hardest, um, that your, your opponent would, would conquer you. And that was good. I, I went for about seven or eight years where I was squashed on. I, I didn't lose any matches at all. I won every tournament. Won awesome. Five, I won five national singles in the world. Won Canadian championships a few times. Uh, and I did that by being very humble. And in the market, it's very important to be humble. Never assume that you have an edge and never assume that your opponent is giving you a, a good shot. Never short, so. Yeah. Take account of the drift in the stock market. If you do all, if you do all those things, you buy and hold, stick to buy and hold them. Those are, those are good rules to follow. Shri, thank you very much. You brought, brought out a lot of a lot of memories from the past 60 years of trading that I think are it's useful for me to think about them again and for your listeners also. Good luck to you. Thank you.